Um, remember we said that, uh, that the Psalms are being concluded by a series of hymns, starting in 145 and uh, concluding to the, re- the end of the book. Um, we are concluding with hymns, and, and this is a hymn that's chock full of Old Testament. Uh, by way of uh, introduction, um, I, not long after I moved here, um, I don't know how I missed this, I, I read it wrong or something, but not long after I moved here, um, I needed something, I needed new shirts or something. And I was on, um, I was on Kasopla Street, and off to the side I saw a clothing store for men, a men's clothing store. I said, I haven't been here very long. Napanee Street, yes, thank you. You know where I'm going with this. <laughs> so, so I thought, I need some new shirts, and um, so I walked in, and they looked at me. Like I was very out of place. And if you haven't put it together yet, (laughs) there is a men's clothing store that is only for plus-sized people. It's a big and tall men's clothing store. And uh, he looked at me, and I said, how you doing? And he said, I'm good. And I left. (laughs) It's like, we're not wasting our time here. I didn't get any socks. Uh, I, I could have applied for a job, maybe. Um, if you can't wear the stuff, sell it, right? Um, our children have clothing that, is, that they like to choose because it suits them. Uh, I have a, my, one of my son's favorite shirts says, Big Bro, because he loves to be bro, right? Or just says bro, right? Just says, it says best bro. That's right, because he loves to be brother. Um, he has one with little monsters on it. Seems appropriate. Um, Lily. Lily doesn't care so much. She just, <laughs> Lily, Lily, Lily's often seen not wearing clothes. Uh, but Everly loves to pick out her own clothes. Everly, it's like, it's a really fun day in our house when Everly can pick out her own clothes. And it's inevitably a dress. She loves to dress up. And it's because she, she's a certain personality. And she gets that from daddy. And um, Anyway, you understand what I'm saying. We, we all wear clothes that are... I, I do. I, I, oh, I'm from the South, and the Southern people are preppy. Like, that's, that's how it is. Um, you understand what I'm saying? We, we have things that are suited to us. When I, used to play, when I used to play baseball in high school, there were some Wednesdays that we looked very out of place because the rule in our house is if the game was on Wednesday you left at whatever point the game was and you went to church. So there were many a night where we went to church wearing our dingy, smelly baseball pants and our baseball cleats. That's, of course, a negative example because there are sometimes that things just aren't suited for the right occasion. If you think about yourself and your own life, what suits you? Have you ever asked or thought about the question, what is fitting to God. What is God suited for? Well, that's actually the question that the psalmist addresses in the text. What suits God? Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant. And a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. 
His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass to grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him and those who hope in His steadfast love. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for He strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. He sends out His commands, command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down like his crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so thankful for this rich passage, this explosion of praise, and I pray that you'd cause us to, you'd move us to worship now. Help us to give you the praise that, that is fitting to you. It suits you. And even in how we respond and listen to your word, I ask that you would give us a heart of worship so that we respond with a heart of obedience. And we ask these things through Christ. Amen. Well, the structure of this psalm is pretty uniform. Um, I'm actually going to draw more of it out at the very end for emphatic purposes. But I want you to see in verses 1 through 6, first of all, suitable praise or fitting praise to the Lord. So just if you were to overview the passage, I mean, you probably observed this in the structure, that there's an invitation to praise and then there's reasons for praise, okay? So there's three invitations to praise in the psalm. Praise the Lord. Well, there's more than that, but marking specifically marking the stanzas. Verse 1, praise the Lord. Verse 7, sing to the Lord. And then verse 12, praise the Lord. And of course, at the very end, we're invited to praise the Lord again. But marking the stanzas are uh, verse 1, verse 7, verse 12. And these invitations to praise are followed up by various reasons to praise. Um, and actually, what we'll note is that these are repeated reasons. It's not lots of different reasons. They're actually lots of different ways to say the same things, okay? Um, and so the first thing I want you to see in the, in the psalm is that uh, we praise the Lord for His compassion. We praise Him for His compassion. Praise the Lord for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant to praise Him. You might have a translation that says that He is pleasant or He is beautiful. Um, either one is in view here. And a song of praise is fitting. This is why we started the way that we did. What, what, what befits God? What is God suit is, suited for? Um, what looks right on God? Well, good. Praise does. Glorification. Because that's what he's due. That's what he is worth. Um, you know these beautiful verses in verses 2 and 3. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. Based on that line, many commentators, and I would agree with them, uh, think that this is a later written psalm, probably after the exile. There's several reasons to think that. Um, but the primary reasons to think that are in verses 2 and 3. The Lord is building up Jerusalem as the, the people were return to uh, Jerusalem after exile, it is the Lord that will build it up. And, and in his building, not only will he build it up, he will restore its people. And that's our next line. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. And this is really where we get the idea of the exile, that he has gathered the outcasts of Israel. This is a common theme that we see in the prophets, namely in Isaiah. I'm not sure what, how well you know this theme in Isaiah, but Isaiah 27. On that day the trumpet will be blown, and those who were lost in the land of Assyria were driven out to the land of Egypt, will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain. They'll be restored to Zion. Isaiah 43, 
I don't know if you remember that text, but it is the, it's the, we're created for His glory, and then from all ends of the earth, He's calling people to Himself that they would glorify Him. Uh, in that passage, it's not just Israel is actually then broadened to all ends of the earth. Um, Isaiah 56, the Lord God gathers the outcasts of Israel and declares, um, I gather, I love this so much, I will gather yet others. And who are the others? Those that are grafted in, Romans 9 through 11. Those that are welcomed into the holy place, Ephesians 2. We are the others. So he gathers, he builds up Jerusalem, he gathers outcasts from Israel. In verse 3, such a sweet verse, he heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. This tender image of God caring for the afflictions of His people. Literally, it's the idea that, that he, He's nursing His people who've been hurt. He's binding up their wounds. Like you take your child after they've fallen on their bike and you blow on the boo-boo and you clean off the boo-boo and you tell them it'll sting for just a minute and you put a Band-Aid on it. God's binding up their wounds. Now, I do think there's an important distinction here to make by way of application. I often think that in the difficulties and pains of our life that require healing, too often we respond the same way our children do in that we look for Band-Aid solutions. We just want a Band-Aid slapped on it. But God is actually intending to heal, and God is intending to fully restore And if that takes cleaning up some wounds, if that takes some purging some infection, there may be some pain there, but God intends to heal. And of course, we see this on full display in the life and ministry of His Son. Um, You you understand this if you've read the New... You who've read the New Testament, I know you have. You understand that when you've read the New Testament that there are healing miracles listed, but the healing miracles listed are only slight in proportion to how many healing miracles Jesus actually did. Um, Matthew and Mark especially use terminology like, and he healed everyone in the town, all of the sick in the town. And so, whereas my ministry day will consist of meetings and visits and sermon prep and prayer, Jesus' ministry day was teaching and lining up everybody to heal them teaching his disciples and doing the same thing the next day and going to a different town to do the same thing. And so, spiritually, he does this in and through the lives of our hearts. Literally, he did it in the life and ministry of his son, through the life and ministry of his son. And you think about these beautiful texts where Jesus actually uses the imagery of sickness to point out the need of the heart. Remember what he tells the lady with the issue of blood in Mark's Gospel. Your faith has made you whole. And so he moves past the healing of the body and orients it to the healing of the soul. We talked about recently on a Wednesday, we talked about the blind man in John 9. And, and, and he uses this man's situation to point out the spiritual infection, the spiritual sickness in the religiously elite. I've opened this man's eyes, and you, rulers of Israel, you are the ones that are blind. The, those who are healthy don't need a physician. It is those that implicit know they are sick. He binds up their wounds. And so let us make certain that in the pain and difficulties of our heart and life, we are not searching for pragmatic band-aid solutions when God has always intended to make the heart whole. He binds up their wounds. He heals the brokenhearted. Loved one, what's breaking your heart tonight? Is
Is it a, a past struggle that you just can't shake? Is it something that a recent failure, something you said and you think about it and you just can't believe you said it and it breaks your heart knowing you've broken somebody else's? Is it something that someone said to you or done to you lately and your heart's broken over that thing? Is it watching your, your child struggle in the far off country? What's breaking your heart tonight? God has healing medicine. He has a heart to heal and He has hands to heal. God, help us that we do not search for band-aids when He desires to bind up and heal. What a compassionate, compassionate God we have. And, and this compassion is going to be set up against something that just seems shocking. And this is, what, this is going to be the recurring theme of the psalm. God's compassion is going to be set up against His cosmic power. His compassion is going to be set up against His cosmic power. Verses 4 and 5, He determines... I, I, I want to read verses, verse 3 and lead into verse 4 because it just seems like we're, like we're taking such a hard turn and it's such a beautiful contrast. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars. I mean, it's like we've gone from God's hospital to you know, to, to the, the cosmos. He determines the numbers of stars. He gives, them, he gives to all of them their names. If God lives in and deals with, in His sovereign care, the names of celestial beings... It seems insane that he knows my name and cares for me. Great is the Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. And we had a, you know, we had a pretty substantial event uh, with the eclipse and something that takes place in the, the heavens that's so amazing and rare and truthfully I was a little bit disappointed with it here but it was okay it was awesome I'm getting pictures from people in Ohio that are like it's pitch black here it's like all right well that must be fun but anyway you get the point it, it, it's it's amazing we have these things that that like Unified the entire country in a time of uproar, and no one's happy about anything. For a few hours in the day, the entire country was like, let's go stare at the sun. <laughs> and I, I legitimately wondered, like, what's this going to do for people's understanding of general revelation? I wonder if anyone went out there and looked at it and goes, how does this happen? I'm not sure how much you know about astronomy, but the sun is considered technically a small star. It would swallow up our planets, but it's considered a small star. If, if Betelgeuse was brought into our universe, it would take up most of our universe. That's one star. That's, we don't have categories for that. He knows my name. And he cares when I'm brokenhearted. He's abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. And then we return to the theme in verses 2 and 3. The Lord lifts up the humble. 
how do humble people look at God? They look at Him with the aspects of verses 4 and 5, and they are astounded that He would lift them up. A very fascinating piece of non-biblical literature is uh, they, they, it was actually discovered with the Dead Sea, Dead sea Scrolls. It's called the Flight of Enoch. And some ancient uh, Jewish writer took the idea that he was not Enoch, for God took him and he, when he takes Enoch out of the earth. And they played on that idea, and essentially it's God and Enoch floating around in the universe having conversations. Which is really a, f- a phenomenal idea. It's incredible. Until you press it a little bit further and you think that that seems crazy, except that the God who doesn't float around in universes, who sovereignly rules those universes, has conversations with me. With, on the, within the light of space, a little speck of dust on a, in a tiny little galaxy. And he really cares to hear about my day. And he really cares when I'm frustrated about such and such or whatever. The Lord lifts up the humble, but he casts the wicked to the ground. And when we see that concept in the light of verses 4 and 5, it kind of makes sense why he'd cast cast the wicked to the ground. Because if we can't be humble after viewing a God like that, we don't deserve him. We don't deserve him anyway, but especially in light of our pride. So his suitable praise, this first invitation to praise, and now there's a second invitation to praise, but specifically, it's an invitation to praise with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. So, thankful praise in verses 7 through 11, thankful praise. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God with a lyre. So now I've got instruments coming in, right? He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares, so here we have it again, we start, except this time it's in reverse. We start with his cosmic power. Verses 8 and 9, he covers the heavens with clouds, he prepares the rain for the earth, and he makes the grass to grow on the hills. This is actually a, what's being done in verse 8 is not a disassociated, it's disassociated ideas, it's a sequence. He sends the rain clouds, verse 8, he prepares rain for the earth, and then as a result of the rain clouds and the rain coming on the earth, um, he makes grass to grow. So his cosmic power causes life. In verse 8. And he provides for his sovereign creation. This, is, this flies in the face of uh, the, the old deistic philosophy. If you don't know what deism is, deistic philosophy is the idea that God wound the clock of, of creation and, and now it's just, it's just operating as he made it operate as opposed to a God who is sovereignly still involved. This is the idea that God is ongoing in his provision and his sovereign rule of his universe, of, of, his, of life, of his creation. He gives to the beasts their food. So the big bad beasts, he gives them their food. And we, got the, we got the elephants and the great whites and all the big animals that we think are scary. He takes care of the beasts and he takes care of the young ravens. So even in the description of the cosmic power, there's a contrast of what we perceive to be might and what we perceive to be weakness. The young ravens that cry, which serves as a perfect segue into his compassion. Verse 10, his delight is not in the strength of the horse. His delight, that which he cares for, that where he has placed his delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor in the pleasure in the legs of man. This is just the idea of the impressiveness of man. And coming off of Samuel, we have a perfect context for this verse. He does not look in the outward appearance. That's not, where, that's not his priority. But the Lord 
takes pleasure in those who fear him. And, and I, I don't want this to escape us. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him, in those who hope in His steadfast love. The first verse, or the first line of verse 11, should, like so many of the verses in this text, stop us in our tracks. Because the Lord should not be taking pleasure in anybody. What in me, even at the times when I think I'm pretty good, could possibly bring God pleasure. Except the worth that He has set upon me. Deuteronomy 7. Because He set His affections upon me. Why does He take pleasure in me? Because He wants to. And because He wanted to eternally. And so He chose me in love for for the foundations of the world. And so he did for all his people. He takes pleasure in those who fear him, those who are humble before him, those who reverence him. He takes pleasure in them. As a father, as a mother, who delights in that moment of their child honoring them, it's pleasurable. It's good for our heart. So he does not delight in the strength of the horse or the pleasure in the physical Uh, uh, appearance or status of the man. He delights in those who honor him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Those who are resting in his covenant. Those who are enjoying the compassion of the Lord. That's That's his delight. That's where he finds pleasure. And And this is where I think Piper's quote is especially helpful. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Why? Because if I don't go to anything else for satisfaction and I find it alone in Him, then I'm enjoying Him and He's enjoying me and we're perpetuating the glory in our covenant relationship. Let us not detach the pleasure of our life from the only source of pleasure there is when God finds pleasure in us. This is the idea of His covenant compassion, His steadfast love. And then he's going to do the same thing in verses 12 through 20, just with different descriptions and with different um, physical, uh, universal, natural, creative elements. National praise in verses 12 through 20. National praise. Now you know that it is oriented to Jerusalem and to Zion. And so the the idea is that the praise has gone from, it's it's a building praise. I don't know if you noticed this. Let me bring it out for you. It's a building praise. Um, Praise the Lord. And then in verse 12, that's verse 1. Then in verse 7, sing Lord of Thanksgiving and bring in the instruments. Okay, bring in the lyre. And then verse 12, it's a building praise. Zion, Jerusalem, everybody, praise the Lord. Why? So the same, for the same reasons, except one is added here in verse 12. Here it's peace, his cosmic peace, then his cosmic power, then his compassion. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates and he blesses your children within you. He makes shalom in your borders. He fills you with the finest of wheat. So we're praising him for the peace that he's secured. The the bars and the gates. The gate's a a very important part of the fortress. And, And actually, if you think about it, it is one of the most important and it is one of the weakest. Okay? Because it's the, the part of the wall that has a crack in it. 
So it needs extra fortification. So who secures the extra fort? Who provides the extra fortification in the fortress? God strengthens the bars. He is the protector. And again, it's set up against, verse 13, something strong and then something simple. He blesses your children within you. There's peace in the fortress walls. In There's peace in the city. Because he fortifies the, the gate and he blesses your children. He makes peace within your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. He provides for you. And then we have, so peace, verse 12 to 14, his cosmic power and his compassion. He sends out, there's really interesting imagery here, creative creation imagery here, by the way. Um, verse 15, I love verse 15. He sends out his command to the earth. How do we know God is in sovereign rule of his creation? He's telling it what to do. He sends out his command. What specifically is he commanding? His word runs swiftly. It's like God's command is being sent quickly all throughout creation. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down crystals. Yes, we live in northern Indiana. We know that he does this. He sends snow like wool. This is actually unique. Why is it unique? Um, this is... Israel's known primarily for, for not being in a region of the world that's particularly wet and cold, okay? Uh, Israel has a winter. It's not as stifling as, you know, ours, but Israel does have a winter. Um, there's actually references here to Job uh, and some of the terminology that Job uses, which is so fascinating. Uh, he gives snow like wool as a reference to Job 37.6. The, the frost like ashes to Job 38, 9, and the crystal of ice, uh, Job 37, 10. Um, and I'm not sure if you know this. Uh, I know we do answers in Genesis, certification in Bible school and all that stuff. I don't know if you know this, but actually um, conservative Christian scientists uh, um, weight their argument for an ice age with Job's writings. Okay, so creationists affirm an ice age too. It's just like everything else. It's a lot shorter um, than what an evolutionist would. And Job is their primary biblical argumentation for this ice age. Uh, there's some reference to Abraham in the snow as well, but primarily Job. One, because Job says the most, the most about snow and ice, and two, because it's one of the earliest books written. So anyway, all that to say, even in the exceptions to God's creation, what the people of Israel wouldn't have known as commonly, like hail being sent down, um, there it's obeying God. The snow, ice, and hail is obeying God. They're listening to the command, verse 15, that He sent out throughout the earth. And then He sends out His snow and melts them. And the people of God say, Amen. <laughs> he makes the wind blow and the waters flow. What are we talking about there? We're talking about torrents and currents and, and how wind affects water. Very specific creative details. And of course, you understand that at this time, having an idea of how the wind affects the water would have been a much more relevant um, a necessary bit of information for fishermen, for people who were, um, ne the, their life, their life has required water. So again, it's cosmic power, verse 15, 18. And you know where he's going to end. Verse 19 to 20. He declares his word to Jacob. And I love this. He sends his command and his word throughout creation. And creation obeys. But who else does he speak to? He sends his word to Jacob. His statutes to Israel. And it's almost like the psalmist is overwhelmed. He has not treated any other nation like this. Verse 20. 
They do not know his rules. He's astounded at the compassion of God to speak to the people of Israel, to give them a message, to give them a message unique to them. A message is, of course, now that we understand on the other side of the new covenant, he has dealt with his people mercifully. And of course, he ends the way that I think any thinking person would. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He is worthy of praise. And so if we just ask the question from a strategic or from a structural standpoint, I guess strategic would also work, from a a structural standpoint, what is the emphasis of the psalm? We'll just backtrack to the conclusion of every stanza. Verse 20, he has not dealt with us. He's declared his word to Jacob. This is verse 19. Verse 20, he has not dealt with any other nation. We are the blessed ones. Verse 11 and 20. Verse 10 11, he doesn't delight in the strength of man, in the pleasure of the legs of men, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his covenant love. Verse 5 and 6, great is the Lord, abundant in power, his understanding is beyond measure. And then this verse that stands alone, it's not in a couplet like these others. Verse 6, the Lord lifts up the humble and he casts the wicked to the ground. What is the emphasis of the psalm? God is compassionate. Set up against his incredible, immense creative power. He's compassionate. And if I can just encourage us to have this perspective, corporate worship is a product of God's creation and covenant. Praise the Lord. This building praise. Corporate worship, what the people of God do, is a product of His creation. Why should we praise God? Because He's worthy of it in creation. But more specifically, and especially, why should the people of God offer Him praise? Because of the compassion of His covenant. Creation you can see resoundingly through the psalm, but the compassion and covenant love of the Lord Verse 19 and 20, verse 10 and 11, verse 6, verse 2 and 3, his compassion. And if I can just encourage you, us, to live in constant consideration of these two ideas, find a balance to live in both of them. Corporate worship is a product. This is what happens when the people of God consider who God is as creator, and who he is as covenant maker. Who is he? Powerful. And how does he, how beyond all miracles does he express himself to us? Compassion. And if he was not compassionate, we would only know his power in wrath, righteous judgment, And if he were only compassionate but not able, we would live knowing that he likes us, that he feels good toward us, but is incapable of actual intervention. But when we live in the reality that he is powerful to create and that he is compassionate as a person, it moves us not just in the in the in fueling our worship, but in the stability of our living. So Sunday morning, when we gather to worship, what we're doing is celebrating a God who is immense in His creative power and yet shows massive, incomprehensible compassion. And as he is infinite in his creative power in stretching the universe, so is he in proportion, so proportionate is his compassion and love on his people. It just keeps going. 
So the Puritans are right. Why does God love us? Because He loves us. Why does God love us? Because He loves us. And the answer to that question is infinity because it's who God is. And so is His compassion towards us. Would you pray with me?